evening, everyone. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Does that have a But you can hear me. Um, so welcome to the first session of the West Hollywood Aesthetics and Politics Lecture Series. Woo! <laughs> My name is Laura Mimbeni. Um, I am faculty in the School of Critical Studies and the MA program in Aesthetics and Politics at CalArts. Um, and I'm the faculty convener for this lecture series for, for the fall. The WAC series uh, was launched in 2011 and has since been co-sponsored by the city of West Hollywood. And I want to thank uh, the West Hollywood Library for hosting us tonight and for the remainder of this series. Um, it is my great pleasure. There are, table, there are chairs over here if you want. It is my great pleasure to introduce Gabrielle Sibyl. Uh, who's our speaker tonight? Hello. Uh, Gabrielle is a new faculty member in the School of Critical Studies and will be sharing with us tonight a work titled Experiments in Joy. Um, Gabrielle is a renowned performer and a prolific writer. Her art writing has appeared in the third rail, small acts, and obsidian. Her memoir and performance are titled Swallow the Fish was named by Entropy as the best nonfiction book of 2017. One of the best. One of the best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she has premiered 50 original performance works, and since 2014, she has been performing Say Her Name, an action for 270 abducted Nigerian girls as an act of embodied remembering. Uh, she's also an essayist and a translator, some of which have appeared in something on paper, uh, asterisks and two lines. So for her performance tonight, uh, she will be integrating from her previous work, Swallow the Fish, and also incorporate material from her forthcoming book, Experiments in Joy, which engages race, performance, and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Please join me in welcoming Gabrielle. How's everybody doing tonight? Oh, I feel so good. I'm so thankful to be here. It's such an honor to kick off the series here. Um, many thanks to Sarah for the invitation and for the entire city of West Hollywood. This is my first time here in West Hollywood, and so far, so good. So this evening, we're going to embark on an investigation of the experiments in joy, aesthetics, and politics. Turn to your neighbor. First of all, I see that we have a bifurcated room here. Which side is aesthetics? And which side is politics? I'm joy. Thank you. Good answer. Turn to your neighbor and when you see or hear or encounter the word aesthetics, what comes up for you? Turn to your neighbor and talk about it. <laughs> Just call it out. Beauty. Sensation. Judgment. Sublime. Interaction. Texture. I, this must be the aesthetic side. I'm just <laughs> noticing. Okay, okay. I'll come back over there with politics. All right. So being invited in to offer something around aesthetics and politics, it felt important for me to consider when I see or hear, or encounter aesthetics, what comes up for me? One thing is this quotation from actually a former professor of mine, rest in power, Tobin Siebers, aesthetics tracks the sensations that some bodies feel in the presence 
of other bodies. Ooh, there's a lot there. We could spend just an hour just on this. First of all, aesthetics tracks the sensations that some bodies, what is a body? Whose bodies? And what or whose are other bodies? Okay, so politics. Turn to a different neighbor, because you know, we can get social, that's all right. And when you see or hear or encounter the word politics, what comes up for you? Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> are you neighborless? You can turn Okay, now I'm going to even switch it. I'm going to make it even more advanced, but more primal. When you encounter politics, where do you feel it in your body? <laughs> really, I mean, voluntarily, that's what's happening for me. Politics. But seriously, if we've now brought the body into the space, if we invoke or encounter politics, just for you, where do you encounter it? Everywhere. 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 No one really feels it specifically <clears throat> in the heart or the gut, the back of the neck, the itch of the feet, the fist. As we move through our experience of experiments in joy today, I want you to consider where are you feeling the experience in your body? Thinking about politics, there's a lot that I could say. It's been a very interesting day, last couple of days. This is a funny quote, and this is a guy that I don't know personally. <laughs> a British fellow, some of you might know him better than I do, but this quote is interesting to me. Politics is the art of looking for trouble, <clears throat> finding it whether it exists or not, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedy. <laughs> well, that's a very cynical, very cynical definition but there's something about that first part. Politics is the art of looking for trouble. That actually is interesting to me. What does it mean to have an art of looking for trouble? If we scratch out sort of the rest of this, although there is something interesting about the incorrect diagnosis or the wrong remedy, actually, maybe the, since the remedies that we have so far have been so problematic, maybe we need some wrong remedies. Maybe we need different diagnoses. But if we just cross out all of that, and we stick here with politics as the art of looking for trouble, and then we cross out politics, and we just think about looking for trouble, well, then you come into the realm of performance art. Guillermo Gomez Pena, whom some of you maybe have studied or worked with or taken workshops with, has this quotation. Since I figured that, I just started off with two quotations. <coughs> I thought it might be nice, because again, we could spend a whole hour just on performance art, what that is. But I thought it might be interesting for you to know, if I call myself a black feminist performance artist, that this is at least one definition that resonates with my understanding or my experience or my practice of performance art. Can someone other 
than me read this out loud? It takes a village, people. Thank you. Performance art is neither acting nor spoken word poetry. We theorize about art, politics, and culture, but where academic theorists have binoculars, we have radar. We chronicle our times, yes. but unlike journalists or social commentators, our accounts are non-narrative and polyvocal. Someone else want to pick it up? Our main artworks are our bodies, written with semiotic, political, ethnographic, cartographic, and mythical implications. We are what others aren't, say what others don't, and occupy cultural spaces that are often overlooked or dismissed. Thank you both. And so thinking about aesthetics and politics, I'm especially interested in this site of the body and also the cultural spaces that are often overlooked or dismissed. Or even considering the body as a cultural space that is often overlooked or dismissed. The black female body as a cultural space that is often overlooked or dismissed especially in relation to aesthetics and politics. The title of my lecture performance talk today is Experiments in Joy. And this title specifically comes from a project that I convened at Antioch College in 2014 called Call and Response. More than a convening, call and response was a dynamic because the structure of the project was to bring people together to meet not once, but twice. And so just to bring in the energy of the fellow artists who worked on this project with me, I have this image of them, and I just want to say their names in space because I feel like it's really important to bring them into the space with me. So we have Awilda Rodriguez Laura from Puerto Rico, Rosamond S. King, from Brooklyn, New York, Wura Natasha Ogunji, who is currently living in Lagos, Nigeria, Marae Regulus from Minneapolis, Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle, Cal Arts alum, who, who's now living in the Bay, but came from LA for this project, me, and then Duriel E. Harris from Chicago. What's important to know is not only did we all come from separate places, none of us, including myself, who was organizing it, knew everyone else personally. I probably knew most of the people, but even I had not actually spent time with everyone. And we were coming together specifically for the purpose of crafting a call. That was a collective prompt for artistic action. Okay. The way that we did this was to just play and talk and eat and laugh and hula hoop and get together and generate a series of questions. Here are some of our, here are all of the questions, but I might not read all of them aloud. What is the urgency of our invention? How does our work change when we create from a place of freedom? How can we negotiate invisibility and hypervisibility in productive ways? How do we undefine the defined? So again, if I come in and I ask you, what is aesthetics? Or notice, I didn't ask, what is aesthetics? I asked, when you see or hear or encounter aesthetics, what happens for you? How do, you, how do we undefine the defined? How can we move through or without fear? How can we achieve radical openness? How can we claim joy? Now, it's important to know, again, 
When we seven black women performers, each with different relationships to the words black, woman, and performance, came together, we had no idea what we would be focusing on, what we would be thinking about. The purpose of us coming together was just to determine what was calling us. What did we think that the world was calling for? And somehow, in part because we shared a similar context, but we were not exactly the same. We had different uh, gender identities, different sexual orientations, different ages. Some of us were parents, some weren't. We had different relationships to the Caribbean. We were a group that included dancers, performance artists, actors, writers, and then everybody did more than one thing, visual artists. So there was, there was incredible intersectionality and diversity in the group, but we also shared enough of the same context as people with strong relationships to the words black, woman, and performance, even though we had different relationships to the words black, woman, and performance, that we could come together. And it was quite extraordinary that the thing, when we came together and we generated those questions, that we realized that we needed to claim was joy. That, for me, is still amazing because that was not at all the where it could have gone. We came together in 2014, and the visibility of black death was great and around us, and there was an intense need that we had, I believe, to call for something within ourselves that wouldn't necessarily literally address those things, but open up space for us to engage. So, how does one conduct an experiment in joy? We had five steps. Step one, the hardest step for me, and perhaps for members of our government, tell the truth. <laughs> step two, make something new. Step three, invite someone in. Step four, document. Step five, repeat. <laughs> what I thought I would do this evening is to use those five steps for an experiment in joy to help. Help me organize and present some things in my own practice as a black feminist performance artist that I believe relate to these ideas or these experiences of aesthetics and politics. Are you with me? I'm sorry, are you with yes. me? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's that black church tradition, you have to forgive me. Okay, so, step one, tell the truth. Would you mind just saying that out loud with me? Step one, tell the truth. Okay, and here's another thing we can say out loud for those who are so inclined. On the count of three, Black Lives Matter. One, two, three. Black Lives Matter. Okay, so there are certain truths that can come and they're crystallized into three easily legible words. It doesn't mean that those words or that phrase together are so easily consumed by everyone. There's still some challenge there for many. But there's a kind of truth that we can point to that can be distilled very easily. Or not easily, let me take that away. We don't need that adverb. It just can be distilled into something concise. So what about other kinds of truth? What about other kinds of experiences that aren't distilled so easily, that aren't so concise, that aren't so accessible or legible, or even fully discernible? What do we do with that kind of truth? And what forms can we create to kind of attempt to contain or express or present that kind of truth? Here's one attempt. This is a section from Blackout, Whitewash, Fallout. Whitewash, a black woman walks into a room and regards a wall 
of whiteness. From floor to ceiling, rows and rows of books. The spines are white, the pages are white, the words are white. How can she read such blinding whiteness? The black light of her body illuminates the words, reverses impressions. She feels it as a violence in her body, a throwing up of words, of bile. She would throw up her hands if she had them. She no longer has hands. She is no longer a body. She swallows disembodied poetics. Aesthetics and politics. Fall out what to do with these visions of history, the problem of these bodies, the grappling of power and violence. White out, I'm trying to explain to you something that you already know. The insidious twirl of brown ivy feeding green on white ivory towers. The way a certain violence enters the body, is intersected, intercepted by ideas. Blackout, a few months ago, I was grabbed on the street. It was a dark street. He was a stranger, although the idea of him was familiar, the intimacy of touch. Grabbed from behind, swiped, snatched. It is so easy to snatch a body. I told my lover, a man grabbed me in the street. He said, why didn't you hit him? I did. I told you that I hit him. That's right, baby. You hit him. I forgot. False memory. In black and white, violence, noun, one. Swift and intense force, the violence of a storm. Two, rough or injurious physical force, action or treatment. Three, an unjust or unwarranted exertion of force or power as against rights or laws. Four, a violent act or proceeding. Five, rough or immoderate vehemence as a feeling or language. Fallout as a feeling or language. Backwash, the backwash of what you have to swallow. It gets thrown up, hands thrown up in the air, but you have no hands. I told him that I hit him. I hit him and kicked him in the stomach. I ran after him and my shoe fell off in the street. A violence was done to me, but it gets blacked out. I can't remember the moment precisely. An unwanted turn, shove, push, kick. The idea of such a thing, the idea the thing is happening. Me. The thing. Whitewash, go back to school, forget it happened. When I'm invited to offer a lecture on aesthetics and politics, I think of this. Blackout. <laughs> Monopolated light and power. Step two make something new. naked. Her posture is a semi-squat. Presumably, it is red paint painted in a circle on her face and splattered around her crotch. But who can be sure? 
she pulls a long scroll from her vagina, reading from it a searing litany of male criticism of her artwork. <laughs> a fat black woman goes to Bilbao, Spain and makes a clandestine short film mocking an audio tour's rapturous admiration of a corporatized art institution. At one point, the fat black woman gyrates her fat black woman pelvis and strokes her fat black woman hands across the burnished walls. At one point, the fat black woman lifts up her short skirt to show her perfect fat black woman ass. <gasps> a fat black woman has a formative affair with her art professor. This would never happen at Cal Arts, who helps her discover herself as a fat black woman. In later work, the fat black woman burns a trace of her own scintillating silhouette on the ground. A fat black woman sits in a traditional position on her knees. The fat black woman instructs the audience to take a pair of scissors and cut her garment anywhere and to any extent they desire. <laughs> Scary cats. <laughs> a fat black woman sits in a dim room filled with bloody cow bones. She cleans the bones ritually with a scrub brush dipped in water. A fat black woman decides to don a suit and crawl the entire length of the island of Manhattan. A fat black woman shares a cell with another fat black woman pretending to be an undiscovered tribe of Amerindians. Mm -hmm. The two fat black women who had intended the performance somewhat sarcastically are appalled by how easily they are apprehended as the real thing how they are fondled, dehumanized, and ridiculed. The first fat black woman is especially upset by the level of objectification the first fat black woman receives, but the second fat black woman, by virtue of being a fat black woman, is used to it. Make something new. When I think of aesthetics and politics, and when I think about my own practice as a black feminist performance artist, part of what I think is important for me is to insert myself into the stories, the histories, the historiographies of the practices that are vital and important and exciting to me. So if I feel them, if I do them, and I don't see that representation in the story about them, I just put myself there. Make something new. How many of you recognize some of the artists who were mentioned? You're so advanced. OK, <laughs> just in case. We have here Carolee Schneemann. Oh, wait, let me turn this light back off. The fabulous Yoko Ono in the cut piece. Marina Abramovich in the Balkan trilogy. I think that was the name of that piece, The Bones. Popel <coughs> crawling in the Superman <coughs> suit. Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gomez Pena as the two undiscovered Amerindians. And this is what the text looks like, written out in this book. And also, there are seats up here, so feel free to come. You don't have to stand. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Invite someone in. 
Maybe we didn't say make something new together, but it feels good. Don't it feel good to say it together? It feels good at least for me to hear you say it together. So number three, invite someone in. Invite right. someone in. Okay. For the next few minutes, I'm going to invite you all to do something with me, but we're going to need a timekeeper. Could someone please volunteer to keep the time? No, 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 because you're working. Let's let somebody here who doesn't have to. No, not you either. You look great. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay, and when <laughs> when I say that the time comes for the timekeeper, I'm going to ask the timekeeper, what is your name? Eric. Eric? With a C or a K? With a C. Thank you, Eric. With a C, I'm going to ask you to set the time for five minutes. And so we'll all know exactly how much time that we have to work with. Although I feel like maybe we want a little more light for this. And during that five minutes, I'm going to invite you to do whatever you are moved to do. Can you please start the time here? A girl who was snatched. A girl who was snatched. Hasara Adamu. Naomi Adamu. A girl who was snatched. A girl who was snatched. A girl who was snatched. How about he? The one who jumped out the moving car. Awa Bitrus. Christiana Bitrus. Gadaya Bitrus. Naomi Bitrus. A girl who was snatched. A girl who was snatched. Rahila Bitrus. Ruth Bitrus. A girl who was snatched. Ladi Ibrahim. Guba Guba. A girl who was snatched. Lydia Habila. Kadimala. Comfort Gamila. Asabe Manu. Kwadugu Manu. Esther Marcus. Sarah to Marcus, Antonia Yahona, Deborah Yahona, Lara Yahona, Mary Yahona, Naomi Yahona, Dorcas Yakubu, Juliana Yakubu, Hadisa Yakubu, Juliana Yakuba, Mary Yakubu, a girl who was snatched. A girl who was called, a girl who was called, a girl who was called, Mariama Yakubu, Rifkatu Yakubu, Jinke Yama, Margaret Yana, Sarai Yanda, Yana Yada, Deborah Abari, Naomi Zakaria, Deborah. Soraya Amos, Abigail Bakar, Maitha Dama, Rebecca Mala, Laraba Maman, Mariamu Mulama, Abigail Bakar, 
Liatu Habitu, Febi Haruna, Tabitha Hailampa, a girl who was snatched, Raha Ibrahim, Hanatu Ishaku, Ruth Ishaku, Zara Ishaku, Esther Ayuba, a girl who was snatched, 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 a girl who was snatched. Hawa Ishaya, a girl who was called, a girl who was called, a girl who was called. Take another breath. Turn to your neighbor and talk up what just happened. Or if talk is not what you need, take a, take a moment and breathe. Perhaps about aesthetics and politics? <laughs> you want me to read it? <clears throat> Wife. Lover. Friend. Daughter. Sister. Mother. You, me, If you see one of these sheets near you, and you are called to hold it, or keep it, or remember it, feel free. If not, bring it back, 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 bring it back. Bring it back, 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 bring it back
bring them back, 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 bring them back. Performance art by black visual artists distinguishes itself by moving away from the stage and into the theater of the everyday and the ordinary. It is often temporal and engages visual elements, whether documents or objects. It is rooted in spectacle and occupies the liminal space between black eccentricity and bodacious behavior, between political protest and social criticism. From Valerie Castle Oliver, curator of Radical Presence, Black Performance in Contemporary Art. Step three, invite someone in. Step four, document. Say it with me if you feel it. Step four. So the first time that I actually performed this work in this way was at Call and Response. Again, that dynamic of black women in performance from 2014. And in the first half of Call and Response during the call, when we crafted what became Experiments in Joy, we also had an artist show and tell. This was at Annette College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which is a, quite a small place. There are about, I don't know, 3,000 people that live in the whole town. And quite a few of them showed up for that artist show and tell, including local hero Dave Chappelle, who lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And so it was quite interesting to do this so soon. I mean, I, I, I don't know how clearly you can see the date of this, but we did this in July, and they were abducted, I think, in April. So a question for me has been, what does it mean to try to still remember them, some of whom have been returned, some of whom still aren't there? And also, what are the ways that we are moved? And in particular, what can move us in public, within something that is framed as art, and within something that could fairly easily be categorized as political or having some relationship to the political. What does it mean to be moved? And what are the ways in which we're moved that actually aren't perceptible to others, the ways in which maybe we feel something within our own bodies? And then what does it take to get up and take that pile. And you see, if there had been more time, I would have picked them, I would have snatched them right back. So the timer happened. I mean, I've done this performance with a lot more time, and I've done it without a timer at all as an installation, and just to see, what, what, what does it mean to do something? And what, is it, what does that look like? And does it have to be recognized by other people? That's a question that I have, and that for me, the piece raises. I mean, there are a lot of other questions. And actually, Wura, Natasha Okonji, who was, who was mentioned, she lives in Lagos, and she just did this piece at her art space in Lagos and had a conversation there. What does it mean that someone who is not a Chibok person, who is not Nigerian, saw something, feels a diasporic connection, but really has US citizenship, is located in a different place, 
is making this work, is showing it, and then she, who does have a closer connection, then brings this into her art space with the people who are there, again, some of whom are more intimately connected to this than others, they activate the piece and then have a conversation. And now, Wara and I are writing up a conversation about our compared experiences of this and the challenges and questions that it raises. Challenges and questions, again, related to aesthetics and politics. Document. I've made a lot of work, and I'm not going to force you to look at everything. It's sort of like when you know, your uncle comes back from vacation and has 300 slides, and it's like, and then we saw this mountain, and then we did this. So we're not going to do that. But I wanted to just show you a few other images of pieces that came to my mind when I was thinking about my relationship to aesthetics and politics. This was a piece called Incur and Flit, and it was about intellectual violence for a symposium on violence and community at Naropa. And actually, the piece that I read, a segment of Blackout Whitewash Fallout, was generated for that symposium. And this part of the performance, um, that long rope is actually tied to the door of the library. That's one end of it, and the other end, it goes, um, it, it wraps back around and is on my foot. So it's like I'm attached to the library, and then I'm trying to mark that lineage or mark that line with the volume, the I volume of the encyclopedia, of the World Book Encyclopedia. So that was one of the things that happened in this piece. Another thing which was interesting is everyone on campus was invited to bring me texts that represented in some way intellectual violence to them. And then I received those texts and together we made a decision about what we wanted to do with that text. If, if they just needed to give it to me so that they didn't have it anymore, if we needed to rip it up, if we needed to burn it, whatever it is, together, but together, I was just there to help facilitate whatever needed to happen around that text. And that was under the larger rubric of incur inflict. This is a chestnut that some of you who were in Douglas Kearney's class last year may have also experienced um, I, I thought I only did it this time, but it turns out when I think about it, I've done it a number of times, displays after being, I mean, I guess I could have done it here. You come for a talk and then all of a sudden someone says, step right up, and then I just pull off my dress and stand up on a block of some kind. And then the barker says, turn, and I make a pose. The barker says, turn, and I make another pose. The barker says, turn, and I make another pose. And then the barker says, next, and I get down and I put my dress right back on. And so there's something about the undeniable presence of the black female body and what does that do to disrupt spaces, especially that are framed as intellectual spaces or academic spaces. <laughs> this was another piece. For 13 years, I taught, and I loved this place, so I don't want these images to give you the wrong idea, but I taught at a predominantly white women's college. And this was a piece entitled, How's Work? <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Okay. Um, I did a whole, again, we could do a whole hour just on this. I did a piece, a whole series of pieces through a wonderful Fulbright Fellowship opportunity I had in Mexico. This is an image from a piece called In and Out of Place, MLK and Obama. This is in 2008, which was Obama's first inauguration, and I came as close to the U.S. Embassy as you can get in Mexico City, which is not that close, to be honest, because there's so many barricades. And I hired these beautiful mariachis to sing African-American songs. Like they sang the Black National Anthem. They could not speak English, and they arranged these songs, and they sang them with me, or I sang them. I had on this ball gown. We did Feeling Good, but I needed some, and you know, I can't sing, I'm not a singer. So we're just out there with different people. They're playing, there were crowds that came, other people started to sing, and then a lot of the people who lived in Mexico City really could not care less. And were like, what are you all even doing? Who cares that it's, you know, inauguration day in the U.S. for this new black guy, we'll see how he does. So it was a very interesting, and um, especially now, nostalgic experience for me. This was another piece I made about seven pieces over that year in, oh, I don't know if this is about to do something funny. Um, this is a piece called Brush, and it was about the politics of black hair, which is a very hackneyed 
and overused kind of trope in black women's literature, perhaps, or black women's cultural expression. But it was interesting for me to do that here, where no one really even knew what I was talking about. And I used these, this rope, and I learned from YouTube how to make noose knots. And so I had these seven or eight long stretches of rope that ended in nooses. And then people held onto those nooses and all that rope was attached to this brush. And I was brushing my hair, jazz was playing, and their job was to try to pull. All of them were pulling in different directions. While I, and my task was to continue, even while I was pulled, to brush this hair. So it was interesting. I learned a lot from that piece because that was one of the first pieces I made in Mexico. And I learned that, that you build up a lot of tricks or you, have a, you make a lot of assumptions about what your own body means, what, how you are read. But when you go to a completely different place in a different context, that actually might not be true. And so, if you're making work that's grounded in your own body, what happens when you actually don't know what your body means or how it's read in a different place? That was very helpful for me as I was growing in making performance. And it really snapped me out of a lot of of just bad habits. Maybe that's the best way to put that. Just a few more. Um, I made a trilogy of brief works after the Haitian earthquake, uh, the 2010 earthquake, which was quite devastating and remains devastating. This was the first one called Fugue. And I was interested in just thinking about inherited grief, diasporic grief, distanced grief, grief that's experienced in the body, but a kind of grief that you feel guilt around because it isn't actually yours. This was a thing that didn't happen to me, except on some level it felt like it did, but on whatever level that was, it's quite distanced from the level that it happened to the people who actually lived in the places that it fell. And so you can even see in the, in the piece of writing that I read, in the live action here, that that is a big thing for me, this question of inheritance or bloodline or diaspora and distance and what does it mean to feel something at a distance? Here, and actually, Wura took this photograph. Isn't that a lovely photograph? This was the second in the trilogy, thinking about diaspora grief. Um, I took it back to the Middle Passage, and, we, and I ended up transforming elements. So what was a shovel became a mirror, and what were suitcases became cash register rolls. And then I ended up doing a kind of ritual and moving it all out to the Atlantic Ocean and releasing. And then the most recent work, I've been interested in conversation and questions. Um, Professor Bryant, who's sitting in the first row, and myself, we were, we were at a panel in Iceland at the Nonfiction Now conference. And what I recall about this, I mean, it was a brilliant panel, of course, but it was sort of like a phrases of black female gays where all of us, Mia the Sheer was there, and H. 17 Sloan was unwell, but we read her statement, and I mean, and it was, um, who was Alia Digme? There was, I mean, it was just really quite brilliant, but I remember for him, we had this conversation, what are we gonna do about the Q&A? Because in my experience, you just do like, okay, all this stuff is happening in the talk, and then, the Q&A happens and everything like falls apart in like this really intense way. So we touched into that. You might have a different memory, but we touched into that and we're like, you know what, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine. And what happens? Like this incredible experience, all these talks are so, so interesting. And then what was it? the very first person, it was like, you, you're fat and black and unhappy and you. Yeah, I mean, it's just the things that people all of a sudden started to say, and I laughed. I thought this is exactly what this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. You know, we we think we're so brilliant. We th I think I'm so artsy, whatever. But at the end, it's sort of like, wow, what size shoes are you wearing? Wow, your feet are so big. Whatever it is, and so I started to laugh. I said, well, I'm going to flip this. Instead of it being 90% performance and then 10% Q and A. I'm going to make a work where it's like 10% performance and 90% Q&A. We're going to turn the whole field of interrogation into something because Q&As are often performative anyway. So let's just let's just do it. So I had a four-hour durational work called Q&A, and we just and I had some ritual elements in terms of questioning and answering answering that was 
sort of woven through. And I did it the first time at, I, last year I had a, a very generous fellowship, thank you, Denison University. But I'm going to tell you, Denison is a small kind of conservative place in a small Ohio place. And that was how I introduced myself to the community. And those people looked at me like, what is going on here? And by the end, people were gazing into each other's eyes. I mean, all this, I mean, a lot of different things happened. And I took what I thought were the most interesting nuggets that I felt like I had learned through that investigation and presented it at the Eclipsing Festival in Chicago. And one of the things that really came out of it is that so many of us don't feel that people ask us the questions we deeply most want to be asked and don't feel as if anyone listens to our answers. So to open up an actual space. So this was a person who I said, after a lot of shenanigans happened in the work, then finally I was like, is there anyone who wants to just sit with me and we can ask each other questions and, and answer them or not answer them, but just be together in that. So this is a person who did that with me at the end of the action. But there were other things that happened, like I asked for a kiss and I got one. <laughs> Which we could also do, but I mean, I'm unemployed at Keller, so we have to be careful. Um, yeah. So step five, repeat. Step five, repeat. Perfect. So to repeat, the five steps of, of experiments in joy. Step one, tell the truth. Step two, make something new. Step three, invite someone in. Step four, document. Step five, repeat. And so after we came up with the call for Experiments in Joy, and I do have up here, people are interested, a copy of that call, which we presented at the community, and I've often shared it in different spaces. Um, I feel like the call for Experiments in Joy has really become a life practice for me. It's woven itself into my writing, into my art making, into my teaching, and into my thinking about how to approach challenging moments or dynamics. In terms of the actual project, we presented this call, and then we came back for a session, the response session, where we presented our responses to the call. And that became the Call and Response Experiments and Joy Performance Festival. So again, this book that's going to come out in March will have more information about what happened. And a lot of things happened. We had a dance party. Rosamond actually was taking little, what, taking people's blood and flex of their skin. I mean, a lot of different things happened. <laughs> Wora, Wora's piece was called Paint Like a Man, and she worked with different students, and they, they filled bottles and were smashing them and painting with it, and then, they, and then she had an auction, and they auctioned off the work that they made. There at the end, you see us again now in the response session, but then there at the end was a community member, Vernetta Ouellette, who came and she sang during the festival. So it became a transformative experience for the entire community. The piece that I made for the response section, and this is what I think I'm gonna leave you with, just a little something about that. It was called, Is the Thing with Feathers? What was irresistible to me? How could I claim joy? After recalling the capture of the Chibok schoolgirls in the first half of our convening, I wanted to respond in release. Not a forgetting, but an alchemizing, a coming together of various materials and a letting go. Some actors have described how scrupulous preparation allows them to be spontaneous and organic in performance. I wanted to make the transition, mark the pivot from external understanding to internal consciousness, from intellect into the body. I needed ancestors to help me. I needed ritual and history and the blues and suitcases and scissors and poetry. I needed a yellow rubber chicken and red masking tape and an audience willing to join me in a flight of fancy into black feminist consciousness. 
We black women have resisted continued devaluation by countering the stereotypes about us that prevail in white supremacist capitalist patriarchy by decolonizing our minds, asserting our own understanding of our own experience. In a revolutionary manner, black women have utilized mass media, writing, film, video, art, etc., to offer radically different images of ourselves. These actions have been an intervention, an intervention in aesthetics and politics, an experiment in joy. Thank you. Do people need to take a minute and loosen their lips with each other and just talk it up first before they make the leap? Let's just take one minute. I often find that's helpful. Especially after I've scared everyone with my critiques in the Q&A. Just turn to your neighbor. Talk about what, struck, what just struck you. a ritual of ancestors at the Claremont Colleges. And it was not a completely successful piece, and I'd like to do more, but the one part that was successful, it was about invocation, and it was really about when you have an empty chair, what happens, what can you do to make the chair not empty? So there were things that the audience was doing with me. We had all these different kinds of cards that we were activating in the space. And it was funny, like this kind of trance thing started happening for us in the space. And after the performance was over, um, a young person raised his hand and said, do you do spirit work? And I thought, you know what, kind of. Except that I definitely feel that I am in training. I am learning. The other piece, and we could do a whole hour on this, I mean, it has to do with my Haitian heritage, my Haitian extraction and the different spiritual practices that I have been exposed to throughout my life. And then, but also the kind of shame or sh or clandestine quality to that approach. But really, my interest in ritual is very deep, is very organic, and it is definitely related to spiritual practice. So that's what I would say to that. Did you have, a, I'm not, I'm curious, did you have a kind of shamanic, ex uh, an experience that related to the shamanic here in any way? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah, but that I wasn't felt, a good question. I, I felt that. compelled to make them not remain uh, earthbound. Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which seemed what your words were doing also. Mm. Even even though you're dropping the paper, the, the the you know the vibration leaves the. Uh, there's a hope in that piece for me. It's complicated. It's a complicated thing I'm trying to do, and it may not work. 
But there's a, I have a belief, the same way that I invoke the names of my fellow collaborators, I feel like it matters to say a name. I have a belief that energetically, even if it doesn't provide material support, even if it doesn't bring someone completely out of jeopardy or danger, if there's something, I, I, that's, a, that's a belief that I have. That it's, it's trying to do something, and I hope that at least the intention, even that there's even something in the intention that matters. Other questions? Thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks for your talk. Thanks. Performance. Um, I was really uh, interested and in, I was wondering if you could speak a bit further about, uh, let's say, norms. Um, and I, I say that because, um, for example, you were speaking um, in a quite focused way about your practice as having this very strong commitment to inserting yourself in particular histories. <laughs> and those histories that you were talking about um, were histories of people uh, critiquing dominant norms. Mm. And they were making efforts to either, uh, to, to ultimately both transgress and produce norms themselves. That's right. So I'm really uh, just cu very curious to hear about your relation um, to, first of all, those works that now are completely, uh, and I don't mean this as a pejorative term, I don't mean normative as a bad thing, by right. the way, but they've become not, you know, normatized, they're historical, we, sure. we all study them, um, they're part of our culture in a kind of global sense, as an art history, mm. um, and they, of course, were critiquing norms themselves. So there's these kind of, like, levels of normativity, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, like, in terms of your work, where you, I guess your aspirations around norms <laughs> for your work, um, yeah, I guess maybe that's enough. And I can go on with you if that's not clear. No, I feel like there are many things you're asking there. At least I'm, I'm having a clear response to a number of things you're asking that are okay. interesting. And it, it actually reminds me that Part of my intellectual formation came of age during what was called then the culture wars, and it had to do with the question of the canon and canonicity. So my background is in comparative literature, and there, I, this, this was sort of like in the, you know, like in the 80s, it was like, whoa, you know, those, those women at Barter put up a big banner over those dudes on campus, and now it's like, we're going to have maybe like Austin, and we're going to have Bronte, you know, and they were like, we're breaking down all of these people, like the dead white men, whatever, but then of course, like, like they were all white women, so then there was sort of this other set of people that were like, what are you all doing, you know, so there's always this thing, like, you think you're so transgressive, and also, there's, there's always going to be another thing, another way. You know what it is? There's always a blind spot, I guess. I mean, I think it's interesting, the idea, too, whether or not those people who were trying to break norms, whether at the same time they were also trying to create new norms, or if they thought that transgression itself could be a norm, I feel like that's probably different for different artists and thinkers. For me, in my particular context, I feel like it was about trying to elbow myself into something that where I really didn't belong at all. And I felt I got the message from pretty much everywhere that I didn't belong. And for whatever reason within me, I wanted in. And that is a different impulse. So I say really, so to be concrete, like if I think about this work we're talking about in the canon of art history. Um, these performance artists, you know, for me to claim Carol Shima, whose birthday is the same as mine, October 12th, different year, but same day, but for me to claim some kind of lineage with her in today's political moment would seem quite incongruous, right? Um, and that I think often, whether it's through social media or just the great fatigue that we have with just the level of violence that we are encountering 
physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and politically in the world today, there seems to be a lot more entrenchment around identity and lineages of identity. And I think that what happened for me in my then artistic coming of age is that I sort of claimed ancestors related to a certain kind of aesthetic approach. People who were making a kind of work that felt interesting and exciting to me, even if they weren't from my same background. I'm not as sure today if people do that, or if they're as encouraged to do that, but for me, that was really vital to gather my crew, to gather my team, to gather my people, and to look at what they were doing, and to believe, for whatever reason, that what they were doing was important to me. So that's like Gabrielle and Italo Calvino. You know what I'm saying? That's, I mean, a bunch of people that really, Gabrielle and Francis Ponge or something. I mean, all these funny people that, why would I even be reading them? Why would I know who they are? I was the black girl in Detroit. But I did know who they were because there was a public library and I was all about it and I just was interested in everything. And so I saw the ways that they broke and then there was some cognitive dissonance that I had because I didn't ask myself, well wait, if, I, if who I actually was showed up to, in front of these actual people, I don't know what would have happened. But luckily for all of us, I didn't show up in front of all these people and I took what they had. And so there's something about norms there for me, it was about, it, for me, there was, I was operating under a different norm about what art was and what my relationship to it could be. That's one answer to the question. I mean, there's more to say, but I feel like, <coughs> I, I mean, there's a question that I feel lurking in what you asked me too about ambition. Do I want to have someone have a slide of me and have them talk about me? Or do I want someone to have a slide and then elide me out of it and, and let them bring in their own identity or their own, you know what, do it. Make that slide. Let it be both recognizable and then also layered. Create the palimpsest. I'm about it. That's what I think. But we'll see what will happen. If I'm working, we'll see. <laughs> yes. OK, so I have two questions. I like kind of the same thing two different ways. So thinking about what you were saying in the beginning about a face man and um, I would frame it as obliteration yeah. you know, of black women uh, becomes necessary in order for the movement of language and relationality to happen. Wow. For us to like come to the terms of legibility of what we can see, hear, and feel. There's a certain obliteration of black womanhood that has to happen. Are um, you saying that that's what you're encountering, or are you advocating that as a position? I, what I'm saying is that's how um, normatively how feeling, right. um, thinking and speaking happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, is, it takes, um, as its condition of possibility, this defacement um, and even the liberation mm -hmm. of black women. So I'm thinking about that, and I have just like a really basic question, which is, if that is the conditions for the movement of economies of value mm -hmm. and a feeling, then what does it mean to throw your body oh, yeah. into um, what on some level is a request to be engaged? So there's, mm -hmm. there's that question. And then mm -hmm. I'm coming at it the other way, sitting and in the audience and also participating with you. And there's a part where you're talking about um, uh, teaching at a, a liberal arts college and, and teaching white women students and there's like, the tit mm -hmm. and like the cradling. And that was like, inc I'm like, I'm not sure I know what joy is, which is maybe like a sad thing for me to say, but I'm not exactly sure what people mean by joy. Mm -hmm. But that for me probably was the closest, that was a feeling of something that I think might be something like joy. Mm -hmm. But in order for me to feel that, mm -hmm. I had to shut up the fact that everybody else is in this room. Right. So that I'm connecting just with you. Right. And so I'm interested mm -hmm. in that double-sidedness. Mm -hmm. So that there's a certain kind of violence and effacement that I have to do in order to be with you and be with the work. Which is actually relate. Uh-huh, I do. But I'm going to try to unpack some of it and make it kind of connecting. I, because those two questions are related in terms of violence and effacement for real. 
They also are related to audience. They're related to double consciousness and the idea of what does it mean to always be aware of being aware? What does it mean to always know that you're being seen? What does it mean to be like, oh, there's this black woman, but then I'm a black woman too, but then most of the people in this room are not black women, and so the way that I'm responding also has to do with the way that I feel that they're responding, but also they're sitting behind me, so it's somatic, it's how I feel, because I can't actually see them, but I can see her, but I can see how she's responding to that. So it's a whole big set of mirrors that you're talking about, which is related to effacement, obliteration, pieces of the self that have been trained to stay very dormant in order for everybody else's cognition to happen. It's, related, it's about cognition in relation to recognition. That's one thing that I'm hearing you say. And I also think some of the things that you're talking about, if some of the rest of you are like, what are you talking about? Um, but I think maybe you know what we're talking about. And if you don't know, get, get on it and figure, you know, like learn. But um, you can read um, M Archive by Alexis Pauline Gums is a text that I think is really interested in epistemology, ontology, and the specific specter of the black woman or the black female body or black feminist consciousness. And what, and also, but see, her text does something amazing because it just shifts what the conditions are for cognition and meaning. So, her, so in page two of that book, or three, she gets into the idea, but what if we actually all are black women? What if that was the, what if that was the universal eye? How would that shift? I mean, how would it shift? That's the question. What would that mean? So when Jean Genet tried to do the blacks, didn't you ever read that play? Then his idea was that it would be the exact same systems of violence. It would just be a reversal. But I don't know if that's true. I mean, I don't know. Is it just strict substitution or is it something else? I don't know, but it's a question. And she explores that question through that text in the archive. Now, in terms of effacement um, and obliteration and joy, I think, for me, it's a longer conversation and a really important one that you raised. So I don't know, see, that's part of it, too. Oh, you guys can't, oh. Like, to me, that's part of it. Just that illuminated, fuck you. Which is, which is I'm from Detroit, and so my immediate parents didn't work in the, in the factory. But my <coughs> uncle did, and a lot of other people did. And like, what does it mean to jam up the works? What does it mean that for the whole, for the line to stop? What does it mean to stop the line when you're building a car? See, in the US, maybe now Japanese cars, people are making them. So that would be how you'd know. But I feel like then it was this idea, you, whatever happens, like that capitalist machine, whatever happens, it has to keep going. You can't stop the line. There's something about black women as a figure that stops the line in the whole system of in the factory of cognition. But actually, the line needs to be, the, something needs to happen with the line. So that's like the gift right there. There's a gift there. And that to me is connected to joy. So there's something around uh, effacement and obliteration that is real. So it's not about trying to sugarcoat or romanticize that, but there's another piece of it that has to do with mm, capacity to catalyze, to explode, to stop, to erupt. To, and that's again that idea of, you know, of making space. And then there's this other piece which again requires cognitive, some cognitive dissonance, but how does our work change when we create from a place of freedom? So maybe we have to just pretend that that exists and, and pretend, I mean, so maybe it's if we think too hard about thinking, we'll think ourselves literally out of existence, maybe. Well, it might be our practice of, of, of obliteration and effacement, which is what makes it possible to open up a space uh, for, the, for the movement of freedom. Ah, say more about that. So, Whose practice then would open up that space? Well, because what, what I mean by that is, in some ways, that encounter of like, I have to shut everyone out in order to take this, maybe it's pleasure, maybe it's joy, I don't know, and to be with you, I feel like those are the conditions of for black people to be with each other, period. Like, the, mm -hmm. in, in, I'm, whether that's like in an, an enclave where it's just us, or in spaces where it's not just us, but we act as if it's just us. We're allowed to be us, yeah. Or, or we take it. Or we, we just claim it, it. Yeah. That's I mean. yeah. Yeah, yeah, So, hmm. I, I don't know how 
to get to that space where I'm with black people that does not involve, on a certain level, like this process of, of a face mask. So what you're talking about as well, I think, is deeply powerful. And like you're, you're making the space right now. You're doing it. That's one thing that I'm just naming, which I think probably other people are realizing it, but I'm just naming it, so thank you. And also, if that connects to what happened with us when we created the whole call for experience and joy, because we created, so that's what you can think of as a maroon space or a space of fugitivity. So that's also, for those of you who studied like Fred Moten or people like that, what does it mean to be in a maroon space? What does it mean? That's where, to feel within that enclave, how can you create that kind of space? And is there an opportunity for art and art making to help think through or produce those kinds of spaces? I feel as if that is a big impulse for me in performance art. Like something incredible things happen within the space of a performance action or a live art action. And actually, I'm a sucker for art. I'm an art fool. I, I sip the Kool-Aid. I feel like incredible things can happen with, within an installation and that also the surface of a painting can become an installation. I mean, incredible things can happen in a book, in a story, on a page. I mean, but we have to be aware of the stakes for ourselves. Some people are more aware and have been made more aware of those stakes just because of their, their positionality, their life experience, etc. But those stakes, it, those stakes are there for all of us. And it does come down, I think, to cognition and recognition, to thinking and feeling. And, and the language. Because this whole conversation also about the normative, the one thing I don't want to lie here is that the language you've been using throughout your presentation has not focused on the academic discourse of aesthetics and politics, if you know what I mean. Well, it's taken, and one thing I did do is take some for granted that this audience would already have some, well, first of all, we all, just as human beings, have, have experience with aesthetics and politics, but to your point, in terms of aesthetic discourse, I mean, raise your hand if you are a student studying aesthetics and politics. Okay, so I mean, I felt like, well, you're getting a whole lot of academic discourse, I hope, about aesthetics and politics already, but maybe what you haven't yet gotten is me. <laughs> <laughs> so then I can bring what I have to you, and then together you just mix that all up and figure it out what that relationship is. And we read Cottenberg were already there anyway. Like, you know, as emblems of as aesthetic metaphors, as aesthetic emblems. So we're there in the classical aesthetic discourse right. as well. Well, and even those beautiful words at the beginning, the sublime, mm -hmm. the beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, those things are floating. Even if you don't say them out loud, when, you're, when you are talking, when I, when we, when society is talking about art, that there are often a lot of assumptions that spring <coughs> from very classical, usually, ideas of aesthetics. And so that's something then to work from. Is this, is this our last question, Sally, you think? You could have one, one more. I, saw, I just saw a hand, yeah. Hi. Hey, Gabriel. Uh, fabulous that you're here, and thank you so much for this talk. Great. But um, I, I think that the notion of joy that you're presenting to us has a, a much deeper complexity to it than a kind of superficial notion of joy that we may be kind of more familiar with either through commodification or whatever. I mean, the, the notion of joy that you seem to be presenting to us is a little bit sort of like how Rincea thinks about aesthetics in relationship to the senses. Mm -hmm. And I also think that the other component to joy that might be missing here is the encapsulation of rage and ag ag agony that mm -hmm. might be found in the sort of um, expression of how Buddhist deities are both compassionate and wrathful. Mm -hmm. And they're both the same thing. Right. And so I think your, your presentation tonight is really important to us because this notion of joy can be superficially dismissed, but at the same time, if we investigate it, we start to see the complexity of it by which it then becomes political. Yes. And I think that there's something about the positionality or the embodiment of joy 
in, for people in coming, living in and coming from social locations that are usually not associated with joy or not allowed to be joyful, that that feels political in and of itself to me. So if I want to come here and blow bubbles or put some stickers of kittens and unicorns on my notebook and call that joy, I don't know as a gesture how much depth that is. I don't know, but there's something there. I mean, and you're, to your point, this question of what is joy? And is joy the same thing as consumerism? Is joy the same thing even as happy? What is, what is joy? And the kind of terror that can be in joy or in, the, or in the pursuit of joy the same way that there can be terror and beauty, you know what I mean, as opposed to prettiness. Like, what is joy? And what does it mean to risk it, to risk trying to get it or have it or believe that you deserve it? Those, for us, that, those questions came out of such a specific black feminist context that it really, um, it was so exhilarating to believe that we could even try to claim that. That felt, I mean, and as I said at the beginning, it was really amazing. That was not at all what I thought we would do, where I thought we would, but that's where it went. And so to that idea of the duality or the sensational, Yes, that duality related to the double consciousness, for sure. And also, a little bit of that fugitivity to say, I mean, the, this, and this is a piece of, in the book I talk about where I, that festival, that we did that, that was a condition of my hire at Antioch College. When they offered me the job, I said, well, you know, one thing that would enable me for you to take this job is if we had a festival of black women in performance. I mean, can you believe that? I had no idea that I was even going to say that. And then they said, um, that sounds amazing. You know what I mean? And so that's how that happened. And so there was some kind of fugitivity just in that, that, in that moment to carve out a kind of space to even then do that. But part of the reason why I did it was because I said, coming to this small town in the middle of the cornfields, I am concerned about losing my own context. I am concerned about what is going to happen to me. I'm concerned, frankly, about my mental health. Like, I'm concerned. So what can we do to open up space for me to be able to be here? Then let's bring some, some other people with me. And then it was, we had our time deeply together, and then we were with everybody else too. We opened it all the way up. We were with everybody, and we had space and time just for ourselves. That was joy. So if anyone has, is, is interested, you can definitely come and see me. If you um, are a CalArts affiliated person, I'm on campus, come knock on my door. I have some postcards, I don't have any books with me, but if people are interested, I have some postcards, I have business cards. And I thank you all again so much for being here. Today.